Good afternoon. My name is David Rogers and I am a the um, CEO and director of the Massyshore Education Trust. And this afternoon we're going to be talking about Massey Shore, that's Captain Sir Air Massey Shore, and also about the famous fireboat that was named after him. So without more ado, we move forward to uh, some information about Captain Sir Air Massey Shore. Now, for those of you who haven't uh, come across him before, Air Massey Shore was born on the 17th of January in 1828. He was the third son of a merchant who worked in Cork in Air, and because he was the third son, most of the people at this time, the expectation was that he would go into the priesthood. Um, unfortunately, that uh, caused a few problems between Air Massey Shaw and his family because he soon found out that the priesthood wasn't for him. Initially, um, he was sent to school in Dublin um, in uh, 1843 and eventually went to Trinity College. And by this time, the likelihood of him going into the priesthood was becoming less and less. He found the, the work that he was supposed to do very boring. He had, uh, had lots of opportunities while he uh, was on school holidays to go sailing. His family had a history of uh, taking boats out, etc., around the Cork uh, area. And he soon found that um, no, the priesthood wasn't going to be for him. So eventually, um, after um, his opportunity to uh, finish his education and to, to get his degree from Trinity College, um, he left for the sea in 1850. So his big ambition was to, to sail from Ireland to United States. And that's exactly what he did. So he got a passage aboard a, uh, a vessel going uh, across to initially to Canada. And from there, he moved down the coast and ended up in New York. And it was in, in New York, as the slide tells you, that America and being in the uh, the capital city and that area um, changed his life. He uh, soon found that um, apart from working as a sailor, that life in America suited him. He uh, ended up finding some time to walk around the cities and particularly to take an interest in the fires that were happening there. And then during this period um, in the uh, 1850s, New York and various other big cities, which uh, he went to as he ended up going to Boston and to Philadelphia. And he found that um, America was ablaze. The country itself was expanding. Unfortunately, with that came a number of fires. And as you can see from the picture here, um, you've got the, the a steamer in the in the foreground on the bottom left hand corner and uh, pumping away, providing nice big jets of water um, and the, the huge crowds that came along. And he soon realized that this was something that he could do. Firefighting now became in his blood, literally. But obviously he had to try and negotiate how that was going to work for him when he got home from his travels. So firstly, in 1855, um, things started to change with his marriage, uh, a marriage to uh, Anna Marie Dove, a lady who he'd met previously. She came from um, Portugal and uh, the Massey Shaw family and her family had, had met up on a few occasions in their youth. And so on his return, Massey Shaw got married uh, on the 27th of January in 1855. And this was the lady that he was to spend the rest of his life with. And as it says on the slide there, it was a very good match. Um, both of them um, had uh, affection for each other, um, great deal of charm, sweetness. And unfortunately, Anna became the long suffering wife. And that becomes more relevant as we move forward with Massey Shaw's history. But she had property and money, which Massey Shaw needed. And as you can see there, she uh, she bore him seven children. It seems that uh, every time that Massey Shaw moved from one career to another, more children appeared. Um, but certainly when uh, in, his, in his later life, when uh, things became a little more stable and certainly in his firefighting time, when he got to, to London and to, uh, to the headquarters that was set up later on at Winchester House, she and her daughters um, 
began to start looking after the poor and particularly the the firemen and their families at the time and uh, certainly she's remembered for being a very gifted lady and uh, a great uh, comforter for lots of people at that time so there was a match made in heaven or not so on his return Massey found out that uh, apart from getting married his family um, had decided that he should go into the army and that's the picture on the left um, in the uh, 1850s uh, 1855 he joined the 10th cork rifles now this was a bulk commission for him um, he started off in the low ranks but um, soon managed to show that he was capable of leadership and people would follow him so um, within three years he was promoted to captain which was uh, gave him more responsibility extra money and uh, also the opportunity to uh, think about moving forward but certainly he hadn't forgotten about the fire service and uh, from his time in uh, in the military he perfected his uh, leadership techniques which he brought across to the um, fire service um, within a short space of time because his families was expanded um, in 1855 he had a daughter Anna and uh, that was soon followed in 1857 with uh, a boy and then a following in 1860 um, he had a further uh, daughter as well so he was now a captain um, he'd been uh, away for quite uh, a long time out of the, th the, uh, the three or so years but uh, now was time to move forward and the opportunity came from Belfast to join the fire service because he found out that um, the Belfast fire service was in need of a new superintendent um, so in 1855 um, he applied for the job and was successful now the Belfast fire brigade was a small unit um, it would only had four engines and uh, probably about 20 or so men um, but it was the place for, for Massey Shaw to, to cut his teeth on becoming a, a firefighter and certainly during the period that he was in charge uh, in Belfast he showed that he was capable of both drilling the men to become a, a good firefighting force but also he was uh, canny enough to start to increase the um, expertise in the uh, in the firefighting that was required based on his information that he'd found in America and he increased the size of the brigade both in the number of men that they had and also with the equipment that was available to them so certainly Belfast once again was a very useful thing that continued until an event it happened in June 1861 and our next slide shows us the Tooley Street fire which happened in uh, 1861 and it was at this Tooley Street fire that the incumbent of the London Fire Brigade as it was then it would be in the London Fire Engine establishment a man called James Braidwood uh, unfortunately lost his life when a wall collapsed on him now that uh, was a tragic event particularly for for London because Braidwood had started to bring together all the insurance fire brigades under the London Fire Engine Establishment banner. He brought together some new um, techniques and um, but the, the loss of his, uh, his life and another fireman when the wall collapsed at this uh, fire meant that London now had to find a new person to take on that role. Now Massey Shaw um, was certainly throughout his career a person who had um, uh, an opportunity to uh, to take to go forward believing in his own um, prowess and so from a small brigade in Belfast he applied now the application at the time obviously without TV etc was uh, made in the uh, via the Times newspaper um, he went along for um, an interview and uh, for those of you who've been to Ireland before and particularly Southern Ireland you've probably heard about kissing the Blarney Stone and getting the gift of the gab well, from people that uh, were there, um, I, I'll just give you a quote about how Massey Shaw performed. And this came from one of the uh, interview panel. He said, Massey Shaw, 
He took the job with an air of a man who was genuinely surprised that anyone else could have been thought about it and why hadn't they thought about him before. So he was pretty confident that he was going to get the job. He was only 32, but certainly the job landed at his feet. But he was now going to be in charge of a much bigger organisation than he'd ever had before. But he was confident that he would be able to succeed. And as we'll see, he certainly did. So on the 15th of September, uh, 1861, he was appointed the superintendent of the London Firing Engine Establishment and took over from Braidwood. To give you an idea what, the, uh, what was happening in that period, um, this is a, a painting showing the um, London Fire Engine Establishment um, and the various insurance fire brigades attending a fire. So the fire is on your left hand side. And if you look in the centre ground there, you'll see the, the manual pumps being pulled along to the fire. And you see the various outfits that people are wearing. The one on the, the guys in the uh, right hand side waving their hats, um, looking very resplendent. Uh, were able to, each insurance company had their own fire gear and equipment. And uh, obviously dependent on the, the building, whether or not it had a, a, an insurance mark on it, a, a fire plaque or fire mark, um, was who attended. But as you'll see, many um, insurance brigades would come along and they would vie for business. So it became a very competitive thing. Unfortunately, um, the firefighting was quite poor in the early days and Massey Shaw, thank you, thanks to Braidwood, had inherited a brigade that was working towards becoming a worthwhile fire department. But there was still lots of work to do. So with the insurance brigades, they had a limited budget and they also had um, limited ambition as what they would do. They would only do the necessary, which involved fighting property and not individuals. So there were times when people um, had to wait to be rescued. So although they, they have arrived in this picture with lots of um, fire equipment, fire pumps, you'll see there aren't any ladders. And the ladders that they did have were very small. So if you happen to be in the upper stories of a, a, a fire, then you would have to wait until the big ladders arrived. And we'll talk about those in a moment. So this is a, a a couple of cartoons and um, shots from the uh, the period. First of all, on the left hand side, you'll see a ladder that's provided by um, a completely new organisation that um, was around um, with Braidwood. Um, and that was the um, and they provided the, the escape ladders. So as I mentioned before, the pumps and things would arrive first generally. And then these ladders, which were uh, placed around London, they were provided by the Royal Society for the prevention of life, um, sorry, protection of life from fire. Now they were once again a, a private charity or organization who realized that people needed to be rescued from upper floors, as you'll see in the picture there. And um, they provided these ladders separately. So it literally was hit and miss if, if they arrived at the right time. Um, the, the other picture there shows Massey Shaw and his ideas. So there's a manual pump, a Nushin pump, which had been around for a while um, above on top left. And then underneath was the, the future. And that was the, the, the steam driven appliances, uh, steam driven pumps. So that was the area that Massey Shaw was coming into in a young age. He believed that uh, uh, firefighting should be a, regarded as a science. There was lots to learn and the, there was lots of new equipment and things to bring in. And that was the way he wanted to, to move forward. So this gives you an idea, first of all, on the uniform. I mentioned earlier on about the insurance fire brigades having their own uh, livery as such, what they could turn up in. So on the left hand side, you can see the, uh, one of the uh, firemen of the period from the insurance brigade. On their arm, they have their crest, and this is the hand-in-hand -hand insurance company. Um, as you can see, nothing to do, not as we would look at today regarding firefighting, but certainly for them, that's how they would appear. They would turn up and do the best that they could with the kit provided. Now, the picture across the way there, next to it, is what James Braidwood had done. 
he transformed uh, the uh, and brought in a new livery a new uniform for the um, fire engine establishment and it was Massey's job then to move that forward to the next uh, level which was provide once again a uniform that would uh, was both serviceable that would be uh, cost effective and would provide sufficient mobility for the fire brigade that he was looking for so what he did was to introduce a new uniform based all around this lovely shiny helmet so why are the helmets important well uh, this is um, a copy of a uh, London pattern helmet it uh, gives you an idea um, to break it down it was able to be repaired so the actual helmet comes in six parts and particularly the the cone on the top to us it looks very ornamental and in fact uh, it was the helmet idea came from one of uh, Massey Shaw's visits to, to uh, the continent he was very keen to go to France in particular and he saw these helmets being used by the the French military and also the sapper pompierre in Paris now although it looks ornate to us which it can be it, it, it's based on some sound principles so the cone itself um, is designed to take um, to deflect any debris that would be falling on your head from an incident and also um, with that because it was um, it had like a cone shape the cone inside it was was full of air so it became an, an impact stopper so really the helmet became something like a motorbike helmet today um, it would take some impact and if you look at the design of the uh, the piece at the back it was designed to uh, to take the water away from your neck um, and I say all of the, the helmet itself was designed to be repaired should it get damaged and along with the the helmet came some new equipment as well as you saw from the braidwood pictures um, the this replaced the leather fire helmet and from there we would then move forward to the new era of firefighting so they had woolen tunics um, which were provided by the insurance brigades and from that they would um, have their own belt and axe they had leather fire boots and certainly the uh, equipment was very well welcomed because it would allow the new brigade to move forward to be identified by the members of the public and particularly also for certain important individuals who we'll talk about in a moment's time so Massey Shaw had, uh, the fireman had brass helmets and Massey Shaw himself had a silver helmet now one of the things if you want to make an impact in Victorian society was to be seen around town and Braidwood had done some early work with making contact with certain individuals who had some influence but certainly Massey Shaw took it to a new level one of the things that he did enjoy was going to the theatre and he met through some uh, acquaintances of him um, Gilbert and Sullivan and he went to the first night of Iolanthe which was a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta and the uh, both of them when he went to the theater he was noticed that he was in the audience and so um, the uh, fairy queen in Iolanthe um, the words to her opening song were changed uh, to incorporate a uh, about Massey Shaw and his new fire brigade so as you can see there the fairies fairy queen sings to captain shaw oh captain shaw my true thy type type of true love kept under could thy brigade with cold cascade quench my great love i wonder now um to us it doesn't seem particularly um dynamic but certainly for the victorian audience who were sitting in the uh, uh theater at the time this was a, a great thing because everyone looked at massey shaw um, Massey Shaw was now this performance which went on at the uh, Jury Lane Theatre for over 50 or so performances. Every time this was sung, the uh, esteem of Massey Shaw and his fire brigade went up a notch. So good publicity. And certainly he was, um, although embarrassed at the time, he was uh, keen to pursue it. But if theatres were to become 
uh, a talisman for Matthew Shaw because he realized uh, having attended many performances that there were great um, issues with the theatres themselves in the way they were constructed and there had been already throughout Europe a number of large fires and certainly um, it was important that um, the theatres themselves were built to a higher standard and that the fire precautions inside which hadn't been looked at for a number of years needed to uh, to be addressed so in uh, the next slide we will move forward to show you what a, a theatre fire was like um, unfortunately as we know today when we go to the theatre we've got the, uh, the the curtain that comes down to protect the audience from whatever happens in in backs um, back behind on on the stage um, this was really fairly new in in the uh, the Victorian, uh, beg your pardon, in this uh, particular period. So uh, once the fire had got hold, because of all the uh, materials that were used, the grease, the paint, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, the fire could spread really quickly. And uh, say throughout Europe, there have been several fires with a number of people had been killed. But this is a fire scene. You can see a manual pump being operated, and the uh, the firemen there uh, attempting to uh, to get water onto it and to effect rescues. But certainly um, Massey Shaw, um, through his contacts, and we'll talk about those in just a moment's time, um, was invited to sit on the committee to, to look at how, the, um, how things could be improved. Because there was a big concern. There were a number of theatres in London, and certainly it was important that um, the safety of people there were, were uh, being looked at. So during this uh, period, um, which is in the sort of the late um, 1860s, early 1870s. Um, Massey Shaw went through all the plans of all the theatres. He actually personally went and spoke to the theatre managers and uh, got them to, to agree that, um, and with support from government officials, that the theatres themselves needed to uh, be, uh, the theatre problem needed to be addressed. Unfortunately, they started to take on some of his ideas and that certainly did help. However, um, there were still large incidents um, around the country, which um, once again, Massey Shaw was involved in um, resolving those issues. So this slide now gives us some information about Massey Shaw himself. So as I mentioned, um, he was the superintendent of the London Fire Engine Establishment up until 1865. And then his job description changed. He became chief of the Metropolitan Fire Brigade in 1865 until um, he retired in, in, in 1891. So to give you a little understanding about what the man was like, certainly for people who worked with him, the, the firemen and the officers, um, as it says there, the often uh, a whistle awakes him from his slumbers in the middle of the night and there's a, a speaking tube right over his pillow. So what does that mean? Well, when I first became a, uh, a guide at the uh, London Fire Brigade Museum, one of the pictures that I was shown in the, in the early days was of Massey Shaw's office. Um, and it was just taken before um, he retired. So that would be in the eight, uh, 1890s. And um, his office was like, uh, had a, a big desk and alongside it were a number of speaking tubes. Now these, if you remember on the old um, wartime films, you'll see with uh, uh, ships, etc. they had a little whistle and then they would talk to the engine room or something on a series of pipes. Well, this was a similar type system that Massey Shaw had and every room in um, the house where he lived in Winchester House, um, had one of these tubes um, and what he would do was that uh, he would call round to his officers at any incident of note he wanted to know about it whether it was on day or night in fact um, it's known that Massey Shaw only slept for about three hours a night and the rest of the time he was up and moving around in fact when he was drilling his men he would get up at four o'clock in the morning and they would start to drill at five o'clock in the morning and that seems a bit um, severe to us, but the idea was that he could uh, get his men out onto the streets nice and early when it was quiet and they could um, do lots of work before the rush hour literally in London started. 
So as you can see there, he was a man who, who uh, utilized the um, technology that was available, the speaking tubes. Um, and unfortunately, his wife, of course, um, slept elsewhere in the building, as did his family, because when he was on call, which was most of the time, he was going to be busy. So one of the things that we need to look at is what he was doing next and who he met. I have alluded to the fact that he had a number of um, important supporters, and this is one of them, um, His Royal Highness Bertie, the Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's eldest son, later to become king. Now, um, the, the prince himself, as the, uh, the caption shows you there, um, he preferred to go to, to a good fire than sitting, uh, seeing the printing of a, a daily telegraph. So could you get one of these for, for him on purpose? That's referring to the fact he went to a number of boring visits. But his real love um, throughout his time was, was firefighting. And he got the introduction from that from, um, from Massey Shaw. They uh, met on one of the committees that um, uh, Bertie was, uh, got involved with, which dealt with the, uh, the theatres. And uh, Bertie himself, the Prince of Wales, had a, a little gang of uh, important people. One of them was the, uh, the Duke of Sutherland, who was believed to be the richest man in the country at the time. And the other one was the Earl of Caithness. Now, they used to all meet up in clubs around London, drinking clubs. They used to go gambling. But one of the, their particular pleasures became going out with Massey Shaw to large fires. And the, the Prince of Wales had his own firefighting kit, which were provided by Massey Shaw um, at the um, Chandler Street fire station in the city. And Massey Shaw would send his own carriage um, and they would pick up the prince and a group of guys and they would go off on basically what in modern parlance would be like a, a lad's night out. They would attend the fires. Uh, in fact, the prince loved nothing more than being on the end of a, a good working jet at a fire. And uh, a couple of times, in fact, he uh, nearly lost his life. One in particular in which uh, a fireman managed to um, knock him out of the way, move him out of the way when a wall collapsed at um, a large fire that he was attending. But certainly throughout his time, his friendship with Massey Shaw continued. Um, the prince asked uh, Massey Shaw to do some inspections of royal premises so that uh, he went to Windsor and to various other places to check on the fire precautions and make sure it was safe. And of course, in even today, if you've got some royal pat uh, patronage, um, it's, it's always gonna be good for um, the fire service to be able to do that and certainly in this time it was uh, well looked upon and also having one of the wealthiest men in the country alongside you was also very useful particularly for the discussions that Massey Shaw was having at this time with his new bosses with the uh, Metropolitan Fire Brigade they were very keen to keep the budget of the fire service down to a, a small amount as possible perhaps that echoes with what's happening today, but certainly um, he was able to use a bit of uh, uh, leverage by having these patrons to uh, to try and move the uh, the fire brigade forward. His um, the prince and his gang were very supportive of having a good fire service in London because they appreciated um, the problems that were happening at that time. So certainly Massey Shaw um, by the uh, mid to late um, 1880s had started to move forward. Unfortunately, um, Massey Shaw was very keen to, to lead from the front. Um, he was keen to do some training. And this is a, a picture of the uh, a drill, a drill yard session um, in, at Southwark itself. This has became the, the new home in 1878 for Massey Shaw, because the old headquarters, which had been used by the insurance fire brigades uh, in Watling Street were too small. So Massey Shaw petitioned the, uh, the fire authority for a new place and Winchester House, which is over on the right hand side, as we look at the picture and the area behind it became the new headquarters of the Metropolitan Fire Brigade. And this is a training session. You can see the uh, the large escape ladder being uh, being utilised there. Um, that was um, 
something which um, was quite new, um, but certainly a, a very efficient way of rescuing people from buildings. And you'll also notice the hook ladders or the pompier ladders originally as they were from France, which um, were being utilized uh, there for rescuing people from buildings. But as you can see, a very productive session uh, was going on and Massey Shaw was keen to participate in that and certainly led from the front. If there was an incident, he would be there. Men knew that if they turned their shoulder, Massey Shaw would be looking there for their benefit. Unfortunately, um, that sometimes led to uh, incidents where Massey Shaw was put into danger. And that happened in uh, 1887, where um, there was a fire at uh, Whiteley's of uh, a big in, uh, store in Bayswater. And uh, there was an explosion and um, a gas main exploded and one of the uh, two firemen were killed. And at this particular incident, um, part of the wall collapsed and, and Massey Shaw was injured. Um, unfortunately for him, it was uh, an injury to his leg. And uh, although he survived, uh, the actual incident itself meant that he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. But certainly um, it was of a concern because he was uh, quite shaken up. But the Prince of Wales um, came to visit and he was uh, very keen that Massey Shaw should have the best attention he paid for doctors for him. And uh, certainly he was nursed back to health again. So once again, it was uh, good to see. So to become a fireman in this period, um, most of the guys came from the uh, from, from being from the, either the, the navy or the merchant navy at the time, and Massey Shaw was very keen that um, that's where they came from for these very reasons. Um, he had to be uh, under the age of 25, so hopefully were fit and healthy. He had a chest measurement for not less than 37 inches, and, and that's around the chest, um, and that was be mainly for uh, the fact that in the early days. There wasn't any um, smoke hoods, etc. So therefore, the idea was to have good lung capacity meant that you were fit and healthy and also maybe could take gulps of fresh air before you rushed into a smoky building. Uh, at least five foot um, five inches, because that meant that you could um, operate the equipment that they had at the time. You had to have good general intelligence. You had to be able to read and write and finally produce certificates of your birth and testimonials of your good character and service. So that's the type of person they needed. And Massey Shaw was um, very keen, particularly that the, the Navy guys kept up with their discipline. The only downside of having uh, a force that came from the Royal or the Merchant Navy was that they were used to their rum ration. And that was a, an issue that um, meant that some of the guys um, were found um, guilty on occasions of being drunk on duty. And that would normally end up with instant dismissal. Um, it was a problem, particularly where the headquarters building was in Southwark, because around every corner was at least a, uh, a one public house or more. And so it was a very difficult for these people. And the times that they had to work, the firemen actually with their families were, were busy all the time. They were on 24 hour call. Um, they weren't initially allowed any time off unless they petitioned for it. It wasn't a right for them. And so um, things got a little bit frustrated on occasions because their families would obviously um, be living on site with them as well. But the, the force itself, certainly the firemen, uh, in, really uh, thought Massey Shaw was a, a good person. They called him the skipper or the long one because he was quite long and thin in his um, in his dress, etc., and his shape, and uh, they certainly were able to increase the um, the fire service and the, uh, the the numbers. So, what did Massey Shaw continue to introduce apart from uniform? One of his uh, things was to to move away from the manual fire pumps and to introduce steamers, horse-drawn steamers and horse-drawn um, escapes. Now, the escape ladders initially, as I mentioned before were provided by the Royal Society, but they became uh, more and more difficult to fund. And so um, in the uh, 1887, uh, the, the Royal Society um, 
folded and got, gave their um, ladders and their uh, fire pumps to the um, Metropolitan Fire Brigade. And this way, they were able to increase what they did. But having steamers now meant that they could provide a better water supply, that firefighting could improve. Um, and it was once again, a very, very useful. Um, and also that helped with improving uh, the funding for the fire brigade. Um, new, uh, Massey Shaw was keen that a number of new fire stations were built. Um, and so a new tax was brought out, a, a, a half penny tax in London to pay for the fire service. And this allowed them to, to move forward. So in um, a change came about for the fire brigade, <coughs> excuse me, in, uh, in, in the new um, council that was formed because the Metropolitan Fire Brigade um, started to, uh, or was thought not to be efficient. So in 1889, it was replaced by the London County Council. So this is a job description of the fireman and was re required by Massey Shaw to give you an idea <coughs> of the standards that he expected. Um, to, do his, to do his work properly, a fireman must be strong, active, quick, fearless, intelligent, but always have, but above all, he must be resolute. At such times, a, um, a fireman um, should be, be resolute and determined in having his command obeyed and having and nothing must induce him to allow men of their own accord to proceed, um, to take presence precedent as they will almost uh, always try to do so certainly from his men and his officers he was expecting high standards and that's something which continued throughout his career but certainly from 1889 and the formation of the new county, London County Council, Massey Shaw was very hopeful that the fire brigade would get the additional funding for new buildings and new equipment that he was after. Unfortunately, um, he found that um, where the uh, Metropolitan Fire Brigade um, had failed, this particular group now, the new county council, were, very, were less keen to, to support him and his plans for the future. Um, and they had basically a number of um, very heated discussions in committee stage in order to get extra funding. So this was the, the headquarters um, that Massey Shaw moved to in uh, 1878 um, to give you an idea what it looked like. Behind um, where the fire station was, um, slightly to your right hand side was Winchester House, which was his home and the sort of formal headquarters. But you'll see the the building itself um, would have um, three bays and uh, will certainly have the uh, horses, etc. will be kept behind. And the building itself, um, based in Southwark, certainly gave them an opportunity to get to, to places around uh, both Southwark and across London Bridge into the city. So the headquarters itself worked really well. Unfortunately, as I say, the um, the regulations that the new council put it started to impose, they wanted um, extra audits to be done. They were uh, uh, we had um, reviews carried out on a regular basis to see whether or not the, the force could be cut. But London was getting bigger and the number of the fires were increasing. So it was really important that they held their their place. So this is quite a rare shot of actually Massey Shaw himself. If you look in the center of the pictures, you'll see Massey Shaw with his hands on his hips and he's awaiting for the uh, the Prince of Wales um, to arrive for a royal visit in uh, 1883. Now, he's, uh, most of the men from uh, the force themselves were in attendance and the ladies and gentlemen were invited guests in the foreground. And shortly after this, um, the arrival of the Prince, the uh, brigade will be putting on a, a training display. Now to the right hand side is the actual back uh, side or the back part of Winchester House. And you'll see there's steps going up into a little formal area, garden area. And that's where the, uh, the royal uh, visitors will be taken for tea after the, um, the training session. But certainly this is um, in, the, in the, getting to the latter part of, of Massey Shaw's life. 
um, just shortly after this uh, picture was taken, he'd suffer another injury, which meant that uh, he had to take some time out, and um, which he, he regretted because um, he wanted to be active all the time. But unfortunately, uh, his leading from the front and lifestyle meant it was very difficult for him. But it'll give you a, it gives you a feel of just how important going to the fire station was, and uh, it's certainly the profile was as high as it could be. Um, in particular, this visit was um, unheard of because Southwark, where the headquarters were, had a reputation of being very run down and most of the society people would not entertain going to Southwark and this particular part of Southwark at all. But having the Prince of Wales come meant it upped the profile and people um, turned out in their hundreds to, to welcome the, the Prince and certainly to um, it helped with the um, publicity of the fire brigade at the time. So this is a picture of, of, of Massey Shaw on his retirement in uh, 1891. Um, as it says there, his employers commented that he was absolute, as an absolute minded man who does not like any interference. And that was the problem that he had with the uh, the new county council who were uh, formed in in 1889. Um, Massey Shaw had a number of clashes with him about um, how the organisation should move forward and eventually he decided that after 30 years he'd had enough and he resigned. Now the new county council weren't very happy about that at all, they tried to persuade him to, uh, to come back but he was adamant that his time was over because by now he was um, 61 years old um, and so on the uh, 26th of June 1891 he retire, uh, retired or resigned and as you can see there uh, on his last day of service he was knighted by Queen Victoria so we now have Captain Sir Eyre Massey Shaw the first fireman in the country to be uh, to be knighted and to have that uh, particular honour so Massey Shaw himself um, what was he going to do? Well, he moved out from uh, from his headquarters in Southwark and moved across to, to uh, the city, to um, the outskirts of uh, Kensington, where he and his family then uh, lived for the majority of his uh, remaining of his life. Um, he, he was uh, soon uh, asked to take on a number of, uh, of new roles. And certainly during his retirement, he became uh, Lord Lieutenant of Middlesex and Chairman of the Metropolitan Electrical Board. Unfortunately, in, in 1897, six years, uh, big one, eight, uh, six years after he retired, his wife Anna died of heart failure. And shortly after that, uh, Massey's own health started to fail. Um, after a very busy life um, and a couple of injuries, uh, he developed a thrombosis in his right leg, which uh, resulted in that having to be removed. And then shortly afterwards, the thrombosis remained and moved to his left leg. And that was also removed. So he ended up for the remaining part of his life in a wheelchair. Um, so unfortunately, once his, his life, uh, as it continued, his health deteriorated and he eventually died on the 25th of August, 1908. So that's a picture just before he died on the right hand side. And as you'll see by that for uh, for those people involved in, in the city and the livery companies, he became a freeman of the city of London. And uh, so as I mentioned before, the chairman of the Metropolitan Electrical Brigade. Um, as his life, say by 1908, he was um, quite poorly and frail, but he'd certainly made a big impact on the fire service and all that had happened. His actual funeral um, was very well attended by numerous people. And on the 28th of August, um, his coffin was removed to St Saviour's Church in St George's Square by a station officer and eight firemen and then he was taken after his ceremony there to Highgate Cemetery which was the family burial plot and is still today 
and that's where he was laid to rest. So Massey Shaw himself had made such a vast impact through both in London, the country, but also abroad as well. There were representatives from a number of his contacts throughout Europe and also from America who came to, to see um, and pay their respects to Massey Shaw. Um, and of course, the, the, the then king, um, the former Prince of Wales, um, also sent representatives um, for that time. So the name Massey Shaw is now synonymous with a fireboat. And this came about in the 1930s where the fire brigade decided in the past they'd name their fireboats after Greek um, alphabet. So you had the gamma, the alpha, the beta. But certainly it was decided that um, something should change. So in the 30s, they decided to call upon the names of important chief officers and one of them happened to be Massey Shaw. And so this is the, the picture of the, the fire float, the Massey Shaw in 1935, um, coming down the slips uh, on cows on the Isle of Wight. And you'll see that the, the, the boat is just being had its final preparation work uh, before it comes round the coast to London. And this is its first blaze on the, uh, on the River Thames. Um, the Colonial Wolf fire. Um, you can see Massey Shaw there laying off from the uh, um, the boats and putting a fantastic jet of water up to the upper floors, eight floors up, um, to protect the building from and stop the fire spread that was happening. But this fire was um, a, a great introduction to the Thames for the fire float itself. Um, and also the people of London, because um, it was in the insurance reports, the boat is the fire boat and our crews were um, congratulated by us for saving over two million pounds worth of stock that's um, on the left hand side of the building by actually blasting a hole in the wall of the warehouse with the main monitor on the deck there and making a fire break. Um, that two million pounds. Um, in 1935 was worth a lot more as you would appreciate today. But certainly throughout her career on the river, um, Massey Shaw lived up to Captain Sir Air Massey Shaw's um, ideas of standards and of being able to represent the, the brigade in the highest way. So her, one of her finest moments, of course, was in Dunkirk. 1940 and this year we're celebrating the uh, the 80th anniversary of the uh, Dunkirk evacuation the boat was called up to go across the channel to um, assist with the rescue of from the beaches of the, the British e expeditionary force now the boat is credited with, raise, uh, with rescuing over 600 um, soldiers from the beaches bringing back another 110 to the UK in two of the trips that she made. She made three trips in all, and also rescuing 40 French um, sailors whose boat, the, the Emile de Champ, hit a mine off of Ramsgate as the boat was returning back home to London. And so they went to uh, assist them and uh, rescued those um, sailors as well. And throughout her career, 36 years on the river, um, Massey Shaw upheld the name um, of her predecessor from the chief. So the man and the boat are certainly well known for um, various things, but certainly firefighting was one of them. And of course today, um, this is a shot of the, uh, the vessel itself coming to the uh, end part of her career in the early, late 1960s, early 1971. And here she is today, um, based in the uh, West India dock on the Isle of Dogs and available for visits etc once the the lockdown situation has been resolved so i hope you've enjoyed our trip uh, looking at the the career and lifetime of captain saria massey shaw a very interesting individual and a person which uh, there is lots more to find out and so if you'd like to investigate you can um, there are several good books. One of the more recent ones is by Dave Pike, um, a former London Fire Brigade officer who uh, has written um, 
many books um, about the fire service and particularly sections on Massey Shaw himself. So thank you once again for your time. Hope you've enjoyed um, the opportunity to explore one of our great fire chiefs. Thank you.